Hello, my name's Diane Coyle. I'm Professor of Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. And I'm talking today to Professor Catherine Abraham, who's Professor for Economics and Survey Methodology at the University of Maryland. She has given a fantastic keynote presentation at the Economic Measurement Conference 2022. And we are just going to talk about some of the key themes that... So Catherine, thank you very much for um, doing this interview. And I wonder if you can start by explaining why you think the time is right for official statistical agencies to embrace big data. Um, I, I think there's, there's really two things. There's the, the push and the pull, if you will. I mean, the push is that our current methods for producing economic statistics are really under, uh, under pressure. Um, and in, in particular, to the extent that you know, historically we've really relied on collecting large amounts of survey data, those data are becoming harder and harder to collect from households and from businesses. Um, I, I you know, Looking at what's happened to response rates, it's just shocking. There are any number of key surveys where response rates have fallen by 20 percentage points in the last 10 years. And I, I think that's a wake up call. So that's the, the, the push. <laughs> the, the pull is that increasingly the agencies potentially at least have access to all kinds of data that are available in electronic form that just didn't exist before. And that opens up all kinds of new opportunities. So it's, it's both push and pull, I would say. Can you say a bit more about what you think the new opportunities are? I mean, there are lots of economists now um, in their own research experimenting with big data and new methods. But for the agencies collecting national statistics, what are the main advantages? I think there are the main advantages are really potentially three. One is that in some cases, the quality of the data, the, this the naturally occurring data may be higher than the data that can be collected through surveys. So if you're thinking about price measurement, for example, if you're relying on a survey, you're collecting a limited number of price observations because each one of them is expensive. And so uh, that means there's going to be noise in, in your data, whereas if you can rely on electronic data that cover all of the products that were sold, you're, you're going to have more precise measurements and, and maybe you have measurements that let you better take account of changes in the quality of the goods and services and so on. So quality is one thing. These data may be available more quickly, so data can be more timely. One of the big drivers is that these data are, you know, so big that they allow you to produce estimates that are more more granular so you know, data for more detailed industries an important thing in the u.s data for more detailed geographies so quality timeliness granularity i think are the big drivers for the agencies you made this very interesting point in your talk about the demand for more granular data having increased and I believe that's true here also, and the Office of National Statistics is responding to that, exactly that same demand. Do you, why do you think that is? And is it something to do with averages becoming less useful as people's experiences of the economy diverge? Well, I think, I think that demand has probably always been there, but there wasn't any realistic way of meeting it. But now people can see that there's all this data out there and it seems more realistic to ask for it. So I, I, may, I may have misspoken by saying there's an increasing demand. There's an increasingly vocalized <laughs> demand for, for more disaggregated data. One of the, some of the interesting work using big data has also looked at things like um, developing classifications for occupations or industry that are mm -hmm. not that we have um, as standard now. 
and would you see much more of that occurring as well and should the agencies themselves be doing that or leaving it to different research projects? Maybe you could just elaborate on, on when you say different classifications, what you have in mind. Well, for example, I'm thinking about if you um, want to look at occupations within the computer industry broadly defined and mm -hmm. categories set out in the SSC and SIC are quite, are quite broad and don't necessarily keep up with the jobs that people have. Social mm -hmm. media is uh, um, in, yeah. in that. So is, is, is that something for the agencies to do or for individual researchers to look after for themselves? Yeah, so I think, you know, from the agency's point of view, at least for official statistics, there is a benefit to having standardized classification structures. So the, the SOC, for example, does get updated periodically. It undoubtedly lags what's happening on the ground. I, I do think that you know, the text of job advertisements and so on can help with telling, in, informing the agencies about what these revisions should look like. But I, I guess I don't, I personally don't see the agencies abandoning having some kind of standardized classification structure. Um, you, may, you may think differently though. Um, I am um, always struck by the, the lags, I suppose, and my bias because I look at the digital economy and pretty much every project run into the problem that the surveys don't ask the questions I would want them to, to mm -hmm. do my work. Um, I, I have that, that, kind of, that kind of bias. Um, speaking of bias, my, my next question was going to be about um, one of the issues that you raised about representativeness and there mm -hmm. is already in the AI and machine learning community a lot of discussion about data bias, the, the data that are not collected or that are structured in certain ways because of how society is structured. What kind of pitfalls do you see for uh, official statisticians in uh, applying big data methods? Well, I mean, as, as, you, as your question suggests, there is there are potential issues with some of these big data sources not being representative. So just to take an example, uh, there's all this interesting work that's been done in the US by the JP Morgan Chase people looking at how consumer spending for people of different income levels has changed and a whole variety of other things. But all of those data are based on their customers. And they only operate in certain parts of the country and by definition, they're going to miss anybody who's unbanked, who doesn't have bank accounts. So that's a, a real issue. I think to me that speaks to a couple of things. It speaks to the importance of continuing to have a, a scaffolding, if you will, of sort of gold standard official statistics collected using more traditional methods that you can benchmark these other findings to and see if they're going off the rails in terms of representativeness. Um, I think it, it also speaks to if you're going to start using these sorts of data, looking at data from more than one source. And if you see the same findings showing up in different types of data sets that have different issues with respect to representativeness, then I think you can be more confident that what you're seeing is, is real. Um, but, you know, but we're going to need to be, be careful. And I think this is going to take some experimentation and uh, working, working through some of this. Quite a lot of the big data that you were discussing is uh, collected and held by private companies. Mm -hmm. so there are a number of issues about that. One yeah. is, the, um, are they going to change the way that they collect it or structure it so you get those kinds of breaks? But the other is um, cost and availability and whether actually it is going to be accessible for agencies. I know that there have been a number of pilot schemes during the pandemic. I'm not sure it's clear how much that crisis-related goodwill is going to last afterwards? 
Yeah, no, you, you, you're, you're raising good questions about the, the sustainability of reliance on, on big data. I would make one point, which is I'm not sure our current model is sustainable either. If people quit responding to surveys, we're going to have to do something else. Um, thinking about what happened during the pandemic, which is sort of separate from the general long-term decline in survey response rates, um, there were also just issues with actually getting out to collect data from people. So it's not, there's threats, there, there's issues with big data, and so we should just stick with what we're doing. That's not necessarily going to work either. Uh, but but you, you're you're raising really good questions about the vulnerability that statistical agencies potentially expose themselves to if they rely increasingly on big data. I think you can partly deal with that contractually if you're buying the data from a company and you sign a contract with them that for X period of years, they're going to deliver Y variables to you on Z schedule, then you have some contractual protection. And if you can you know, sign contracts that are updated on a rolling basis so that you're always looking several years ahead, that would help. Where you can, having multiple suppliers may help. I was interested with the, the work that the Census Bureau is doing on replacing, this is a, just a real small example, but uh, replacing its survey of local building permit offices with big data. They're actually turning to two companies, not just one company. So um, they, there's some, some re, they're not completely redundant with one another, but there's some redundancy built in there. And that would be something else to think about is you know, rather than just going to one outside company, maybe you go to two and then you have some uh, protection. But I, I know this is something that the this agencies will have to think about as they move in this direction. I know, I know that I know they are thinking about. There was a very interesting question came up in the discussion after your talk from somebody who said, um, Part of the function of official statistics is to create a level information playing field mm -hmm. and what enables the economy to thrive and, and competition to occur. I was on a panel chaired by Jason Furman looking at competition in digital markets. Mm -hmm. And one of the barriers to entry in, into those markets that we identified was um, the accumulation of very large stores of data by certain companies that gave them uh, a, actually an interest advantage over time compared to others and we thought a potential remedy for that which the competition market authority is looking at is requiring some kind of data access through APIs. Do you not think that would be a good way for governments to go for um, statistical production as well? That there should just be a requirement as part of the social license? Well I have to say this is not not an issue I have thought a lot about. I thought it, I also thought that was a really interesting question. To the extent that people that companies have developed these big big data banks, they've invested real resources in compiling those those data. So I, I don't think this is what you're suggesting. You you couldn't I think reasonably just require them to make the data freely available but you know, requiring you know, making it a requirement that the data be licensed on some set of terms um, could be could be a reasonable way to go um, it's, a, it's an interesting question I, I, I hadn't I had had not thought about this set of issues and I think like so many of the other issues we've touched on, the how things will work out in the end isn't, isn't yet clear. This is an exciting experiment. I think my final question to you would be about what would you hope to see in terms of statistical production, say in three or four years time? What would a, an on the ball um, statistical agency have done in terms of its big data use by then? I would I, I think the, the low-hanging fruit 
for use of big data is improving early estimates of indicators like personal consumption expenditures or, or GDP. And I think the, the issue there is that survey data lag. So when early estimates are released, they aren't available. If you, if you look at how the BEA produces GDP for segment after segment, when you, the methodology for the first estimates is judgmental trend which is not very satisfactory. So I think we could do a lot better with producing um, first estimates that are more reliable. So I think that's one low hanging, one type of low hanging fruit. The other type of low hanging fruit, I think is making use of the scale of these big data to produce more geographically disaggregated estimates, something we were talking about before. There's just lots of areas where that should be possible. If you're thinking about uh, the healthcare sector, for example, we currently produce basically national estimates and some state estimates, but you could produce things at a that were much more granular, given information on insurance records, for example. And there, there's lots of other examples of that. So. If you're talking three or four years, I think that's what's realistic. If you're talking a longer time frame, you know, maybe we re-engineer re our whole data production infrastructure. And maybe instead of having surveys for prices and surveys for sales, we inhale scanner and other point of sale data and use that information to produce both in a more integrated fashion. But I don't think that's a three or four years from now proposition. I think that's a longer term effort. I think in any case, we'll all be uh, tooling up our, our data science skills so we can uh, start deploying these new methods ourselves. Absolutely. Abraham, thank you so much. Fascinating talk, which I hope people will go and look at. And thanks again for talking to us. Thank you, Diane.